All right, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the November edition of the Fission Reactor Call. Uh, a bunch of us uh, just got back from Lisbon where we had uh, lots of excitement about the things that we're working on, which is always great. Uh, and we in fact now have a few more people um, who were I think also around for last month, but it means that we have more stuff going on. So uh, obviously the work with Dialogue uh, is continuing and I'll let uh, Quinn talked through that. We're also working on a, a name system. Um, so think essentially like a, a decentralized version of, well, DNS is already decentralized, but uh, a peer-to-peer -peer version of DNS, um, including um, the ability to verify offline that a user has access to that name. It can be things like email, DNS records, et cetera. Uh, if Blaine, uh, or when, when Blaine joins, um, uh, you can hear a little bit about that. Um, we're continuing work on uh, data transfer protocols as well. So um, replacing, hopefully replacing BitSwap from IPFS with uh, something a little bit more performant and more reliable, and that works um, in, in more places. So Car Mirror um, is coming along, and that's actually outside of the reactor already. We have code that should be uh, able to be played with like relatively soon, um, but that's a point-to-point -point protocol. Uh, and we have some early thoughts on how we can extend that now to be uh, a uh, multi, um, uh, basically a many-to-many -many protocol. Um, and uh, Zishan uh, uh, may have some thoughts for that later, depending on how much uh, he, he's willing to share this early. It's very, very early. Um, and uh, finally, IPVM. An interplanetary virtual machine, which is a distributed um, uh, execution environment, which is what we've been trying to get to this whole time, um, is fi finally coming along. Um, so uh, because there's not a huge amount of update on IPVM, um, I'm, uh, we'll start there and then maybe let uh, Zishan talk about some early thoughts on Carpool and then uh, hand it over to Quinn. Um, so let me uh, share my screen here really quick. So many tabs open. All right, everyone sees the readme? Awesome. Do you have so, a lot of tabs? Uh, I have a lot of tabs, yeah. Um, IPVM. Uh, so this is uh, essentially a WASM execution, um, fully distributed, but also local first. So everything should be able to run totally um completely locally but you should also uh, be able to kick a job off um into a uh, into a network and say hey who wants to run this for me either altruistically or uh you know potentially you have some relationship with them and you have your credits or something right um the um the wasm parts are actually pretty straightforward right it's like you're going to pass some arguments uh to Wasm, have it execute. That's pretty easy. The, the hard part is dereferencing pointers, sending email, um, all of that stuff. So uh, while we were in Lisbon, we talked to a bunch of other projects, including Bacliao, which is a primarily a um, Docker, roughly a Docker version of this that's not deterministic, um, that handles workloads, sort of like your, your existing workload, any Docker container, you can pass things into it to run. Um, they also have uh, some early thoughts on, on Wasm as well. Um, and Warp Forge, which is a deterministic build system, think Nix, but without the, the Nix parts, um, where uh, the goal is that you should be able to build libc from source uh, and have that all work. And that expects to have access to a POSIX file system and you know all, all of these other bits kicking around, um, but want to make that deterministic. So also kind of related, right? right? We have some execution that's happening in a distributed way. We're caching results. Um, we, we want the determinism. Um, and there's a couple others, bucket VM and a few more. We were looking at all of these going like, hmm, these all have some overlap. What if we could find one invocation model that could uh, handle all of these. Uh, and so that is a sort of a stretch goal right now for IPVM. 
on the invocation spec. And in fact, just before this call, I got a ping from the back of the outlook saying like, hey, we should probably like actually schedule a call to make sure that we're getting, you know, hitting all of the all of the points. Um, one of the challenges with this is that um, Docker and Wasm, for example, have very different requirements. They have different configurations. This is essentially a configuration DSL, right? Um, so there's a little bit of work to be done in figuring out what parts are common that we can pull out and put into the wrapper versus that have to be in each job specification um, and how we would make them work together when you have non-deterministic things, piping data into deterministic things and back out. Um, the basic idea right now is we'll use an effect system where we separate out basically pure from impure things. So uh, I wrote this up right before uh, flying to uh, flying to Lisbon a couple of weeks ago, um, which kind of shows the, the, the overall data structure. Um, and there's a PR open here um, with some uh, very early version of the spec, mo mostly just me playing around with like, okay, what are the common parts that we need to pull together uh, and make this thing work? Um, but the, the underlying concept is pretty solid at this point of um, configuration, uh, sorry, convention over configuration Kind of roughly what the layout should look like that we don't have nested calls everything's at a top layer and and can um uh, call it to things by name even though it's all content addressed how we're going to actually handle the um memoization all of that is, is essentially pretty solid uh we're now at the write up uh the actual field names and argue about them stage so that's roughly where that's at um there's a very messy pr right here uh, uh happening um on that project. So um, if anybody has questions about that, uh, happy to take them now. Otherwise, we can move on to Zishan. I know you've been spending a lot of time thinking about how to consolidate all these different job specs for products like IBVM and Bound Allow and so on into one format. Are there any pieces of those formats that are standing out as possibly being challenging or problematic uh, in terms of making that work? Yeah, um, the, the main challenge is that they all have very different fields that they even need to consume, right? Uh, so, for example, in Warp Forge, um, they essentially mount a volume and pass in um, uh, like an environment variables, set of environment variables um, that we don't really have as a concept in um, in Wasm at all, right? It's like you're not going to have something ambiently. You get arguments. These are your arguments, and that's it. Um, so the current thinking there, there's two possible ways of approaching this, right? One is um, have have them all define themselves as literally as effects and we can call out into their system and just give up on the unified uh, invocation spec approach. So one, one option. The other is we treat the content of every action, every job inside the um, inside the, the graph of jobs as um, some sort of variance type that takes, you know, it, it probably wouldn't be openly extensible, um, but uh, at least to get started would support, you know, Bacalhau and or Forge and, you know, a, a few of these. Um, we do want to have this extensibility and the ability to kick things out into totally separate processes. So it does feel relatively clean doing it that way. Um, but it would be nice to be able to re reuse each other's work. And so that's the um, the motivation to try to get one thing that that does work there. There's always that old XACD comic that uh, there's 14 competing standards. So let's make one standard that has all of them. So now there's 15 mm -hmm. competing standards. Um, the hope is that we're early enough in all of these projects that we can just adopt the one thing and there won't be these other versions, right? Uh, Warp Forge is really just getting started. Bucket VM is currently an internal project inside of DAG House. Um, uh, Backlayout is very, very much pre-release, right? So like maybe it's early enough that we can make this happen if it doesn't happen it's fine um but it, it would be nice to be able to reuse tooling yeah that totally makes sense thanks um now i don't want to derail the conversation too much but uh i know that having that open sensibility from the beginning is definitely not a goal that complicates things considerably but i know that ipfs 
accomplishes a lot of this with like multi formats and multi codecs and things like that. Do you know if that's been a successful approach and if that's something that down the road might be useful here? Yeah, uh, so a common misconception about multi formats is that they're for interoperability. They're not, uh, oh. it's for upgradability. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so it does let you detect this is this kind of thing, that's that kind of thing. Um, but it's less for, I will be able to work with any of these formats at any time. And more, uh, I went from version one to version two, and I now support this hash algorithm instead of that hash algorithm. Right. Okay. That's, um, that's, no, that's a misconception I held. <laughs> yeah, it's a misconception everyone has. I, I had that uh, as, as well. So yeah. Um, uh, so maybe to take it a couple steps back. So in, in the IPFS world, um, they essentially prepend magic bytes to the front of um, just binary blobs. To say, hey, the thing coming next is formatted this way, been hashed with this algorithm, and it's, you know, I don't know, JSON, right? Um, most applications don't need, need all that information, right? They know they're getting JSON, um, or that they're only going to support, you know, these three formats and they can either do, uh, you know, mime type sniffing or, or whatever the thing is, um, they don't have support in there for, this is a JPEG versus a PNG versus something else, right? It's really just, uh, transmission formats for the consuming of the, the raw bytes. Um, it has started to widen more to include things like public keys and like all, all of this other stuff. And actually that whole table is now getting moved over into the IETF, which is kind of exciting. But uh, having to support everything in the table is an impossible task. So it's, it's really to say like, okay, I know this is one of the old ones because it's formatted like this and I didn't want to put a version number on it. This is the, you know, I'm going to upgrade it in this way, let's say, or or fall back to, a, to an older version of the code. Uh, Mark and Fon. Um, just checking. Oh, sorry. The, the, when you speak about environment variable, I know common, common use is uh, secrets. So mm -hmm. if they become uh, parameters, are the parameters mm -hmm. in the uh, encrypted, knowing you, I suspect, but this is the classic question. And second, could you just have a dictionary of the environment, encrypted of course, dictionary of the environment variable and be that a parameter and kind of abstract over environment that way? Or is that too simple-minded? Why does that simple-minded thing fail really? <laughs> yeah, so um, there's, the, the short answer is yes, we want to be able to pass arguments around to do things like secrets, pass in a, a decryption key, all of the stuff, right? Um, the problem with private data is it should be private and you're about to put it on a public network. Exactly. Right? So we've taken the, the concept of affinities out of really the, the rest of the orchestration world, to, which is normally used for things like, well, do you have a GPU or not? So down the road, we, we may add, I don't know, CUDA support and then say like an affinity is you have a GPU on the machine. But um, these are more like, do you have the decryption key for the data that I wanna work on? And then a flag to be like, and then don't publish the result, you know, right? Um, or or, please, or, or, uh, or encrypt it with the same key. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like on the way out, you can re-encrypt and then make it public. But if you're going to decrypt it and then hand it out to an application, you don't want it to be like that. So it can only run on certain machines now. And that from an orchestration perspective is really difficult because now you might not always have a machine capable of running it. But this is the same as I want to, at the end of this pipeline for you to send a, a notification email. Most machines can't send that email, right? I was going to so, say, why, why emails? That was my other puzzle because it seems to me if you have the abstract concept of job queue, like in queuing a completion token and watching a completion token on a, it's basic stream logic. So why not have email to be just one possible queue consumer? <laughs> Job and, queue. And, and that's essentially what, what it is. So the, okay. um, the runtime sees an effect that says, please run email. Uh, here's a proof that I'm allowed to do this. Maybe it's a you can, maybe it's something else. Um, and I know that it's over on, you know, uh, this machine, and that comes out as a declarative spec. So the whole thing is declarative. Actually, I should talk about that 
a couple more points about that in a second. That's entirely declarative. The runtime sees that, and because it's one of the registered effects that it knows what to do with, it can then talk to the Web2 service, let's call it um, MailChimp, and say, hey, here's the thing you actually need to do. And it can kick right. that process off over there. Um, but it doesn't depend on the mail service, which might not know anything about this, to watch the entire stream. Um, there's also a performance but, reason what, what, but, Well, you could have something that's just a stream watcher that then talks to MailChimp or something. What, what I'm saying right. is, so, because it could be it uh, could be a pager, it could be, uh, sorry, that's archaic, but it could be an SMS, it could be whatever. And that shouldn't be mm -hmm. part of the spec. What you're saying is when you're done, go to the next stage and the next stage is this thing, which will do whatever this thing does. Yeah, exactly. Um, so part of the scheduler itself is determining what is going to all run on one, this is actually exactly the, the deterministic stuff I want to talk about, is going to determine what runs on one machine versus on many. Anytime you have to go back out into the network, you're incurring a cost. So really you want stuff to run on a single machine as much as possible. So, so, so um, for example, mail becomes another capability that's needed of yeah, it, it or, becomes or part of the affinity calculation. You have to have this key exactly. and have email to, or SMS or whatever capability for output. Got it. Yeah. So you're more likely. It might not be that you're for sure going to get the job, but you're much more likely to get the job if you have all the capabilities. So yes, service discovery. Perfect sense. Okay. Um, yes. In terms of things being declarative, um, there's been a lot of thought that's gone into how we describe how to move from one job to the next. Um, one of those is, uh, it, this has to form a DAG, right? So we have some graph of computation, um, and ideally we can make this so that the, um, the scheduler can just look at the dependencies between things and schedule them automatically. So not to say this comes before that, it comes before that, it comes before that. We want to be, to be given the flexibility to say, these things don't have dependencies on each other, so they can run before, after, or at the same time. And that gives us writing the scheduler a lot of flexibility between those, which means you can even start, they don't have to even have a common root. You could say, hey, run these totally separate graphs, especially, especially important for destructive side effects. So I'm going to send, uh, I'm going to post a, never mind a tweet, we're going to post some, uh, a toot to Mastodon. Um, that has now changed the world somehow. Maybe the tweet itself has also changed the world, um, but that, that has affected the, the, the world outside of it. We can't undo that, right? So if there's partial failure in these jobs, that's a problem. So by making effects happen somewhere outside, we know that this has to go out and then at other points, things have to come back in potentially off of that effect. And so the, there's both like, hey, do this eagerly and do this lazily. In the lazy version, it actually might be slightly slower, but it's way safer in cases of partial failure. Uh, Quinn. Yeah, um, just now when you're talking about uh, the scheduler, the execution engine, you mentioned that the plans for these jobs need to form a DAG. Uh, through Dialog, we've done a lot of work in thinking about what simple data flow and so on looks like. Mm -hmm. um, goal currently for IPVM. Or is the intent there to model that sort of cyclic data flow as a DAG using like the sort of temporal edges that I've talked about in the past? Um, yeah. So I, I've gone back and forth on this. Like, if you want to have cycles, um, there's an, there's entirely good use cases for that. Uh, my gut says to actually keep that out completely okay. because I uh, you need gas. You're probably going yep. to be paying for computation. Yeah. Um, and if you have a cycle, now you can't do accurate gas measurement unless you say for the entire job, for the entire thing, I have this much. The way that we handle this, um, like let's say I, I need to do a map reduce. So I need fan out on an unknown amount of data. It's going to depend on my arguments. I'm going to do some computation on it and then fan a bunch of jobs out. We use the effect system to on queue new jobs. So let's say that I wanted to build hypothetically speaking, um, actors or something like um, uh, object capabilities, VAT TP, all of this stuff, right? On top of this, 
uh, you can essentially treat this as I have a mutable pointer somewhere. That's my mailbox. I got kicked off as a job. I run through. And at the end, I on queue myself again. But that's as a new job completely. And that might run on a computer on the other side of the planet. Right? Um, so we can build loops. We can do all of this stuff. Um, the simpler we keep the, uh, the structure, the easier it will be to work with. Um, having, uh, we don't have the niceties of knowing that uh, there's a, um, a fixed point, right? I could send tweets forever, right? Um, and having, being able to get in the middle there and say, okay, you think that you need to unqueue a new thing. Do you actually have the ability to do that? It seems like a nice break point. Um, it's not fully ruled out yet, though. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. And implementing like the actor model is essentially what I had in mind, or being able to model the sorts of like long running smart contracts we see in like Ethereum. Um, yeah. But what you're saying about having that separate layer that handles re and queuing the job to handle those cycles makes sense. And it almost feels analogous to like a trampoline and like a compiler, mm -hmm. but that is able mm -hmm. to account for like gas costs. Yes, yeah. Um, the, I guess, yeah, two, two things there. One, gas costs, uh, we'll probably need something at some point that asks the user, hey, can I have more gas or should I just suspend, right? And then do we do suspend to disk or something unknown? Um, the second thing, uh, it is a explicit project goal to build full-blown object capabilities on top of this thing. Okay, so it means we both have MapReduce, which is very functional style, and out of those components at a higher level of abstraction by doing the reon queuing, by uh, passing around uh, cryptographic tokens. Uh, I, I think in the same way that Agoric has done this, I think that we can build out, out of those simple components um, really nice high level um agents yeah that sounds great that makes sense thanks awesome uh anything else before we move on to um yeah okay i see lots of head shaking <laughs> um i'll actually change, change the order here uh, a little bit um uh blaine not not to put you too much on the spot um any interest in talking a little bit about uh early sketches uh, for, for who can. Sure. Um, yeah, so we had some really great conversations uh, in Lisbon about this stuff and Ar Arakli has, um, uh, I think, made the, the best uh, spec I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is in the form of a cartoon. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, the, the basic, actually, Arakli, why don't you, you, so we, we had some initial thoughts about, um, uh, about who can, that I had sketched up and then Arakli made them a thousand times better. So why don't you talk about the, the, the approach? Um, cause I'm, I'm, this is one, uh, this week has been a lot. Um, but this is the thing that has ex like just taken over my brain. Um, and uh, I'm super excited about all of the the implications. But I think the 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 core bit um is is really Arakley's thought here. So um yeah, do you wanna do you wanna introduce that? Uh sure. Uh, hi everyone. Um not super prepared for this, but I'll I'll try to improvise. Uh so there's a repo that I created in the specs that kind of tries to outline it in a little more detail, but it's kind of not really complete. But if you want to comment and look at it, please do. There are slides that had been shared on, across the channels and you can look at them as well. Um, I think bigger picture uh, that I try to kind of tease out from um, uh, uh, Blaine's work is slightly decouple Hukan from the email uh, uh, resolving email address to the ID key piece because then we can layer other things on top. Um, so what it boils down to, at least in the current proposal in the spec, is to come up with a new DID mail to method. Um, and in the Yukon world, you then can use DID mail to uh, colon email address identifiers 
uh, for the actors. Um, but if you do, then you need to provide a, a fact within the Yukon that essentially extract of a DKIM uh, header that proves that you actually delegate that links from your email to some public key, which is used uh, to sign this Yukon. Uh, I think that's roughly- can, can, we take a, a, can we take a step back and talk about the problem that we're trying to solve for, for those of us who aren't listening? Uh, fair enough, yeah. Um, so I, I can speak for like Doug how this problem and how we're trying to solve it. And uh, maybe you're blank and feeling on the other side of things or your side of uh, things. So for us, main problem had been uh, people don't like uh, saying public keys or writing them necessarily because they're hard to memorize. Um, it also means that say, if I wanna share some set of capabilities with uh, say Brooklyn, I need to ask, hey Brooklyn, what's your DID key so I can even create such a Yukon. Um, if we leverage emails, we kind of solve a lot of problems like that. I kind of already know Brooklyn's email address, or I, chances are I can find at least one of her email addresses. And then I can issue delegation. Uh, independent from that, then Brooklyn can create a sub delegation from her email address to DID key. And suddenly we have a whole chain of delegations that we can use, which means suddenly people can start delegating to others uh, without knowing what their DIDs are, or those people may not even have DIDs yet. They can create them after the fact. Uh, and because uh, how widely adopted DKIM protocol is, basically every email provider sends emails with those headers. So it's really easy to get a proof that you own the email address by just sending an email. Does that kind yeah. of answers? Yeah. Uh, and, oh, and uh, more importantly, I guess it's also creates a really good way for us to create a user names or not create a user names. We don't need our own namespace anymore. Everyone has email. So then they can just bring their name, email address and that's kind of their namespace. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and I think that um, uh, it's hard to know where to start without going through the whole history of how this idea evolved. But I think it's... Um, uh, it's basically, um, if this sounds familiar to, to Keybase, um, it, it's, it's because it, it's, it's basically a Keybase style approach, right? Like, it, um, you know, we could apply this, the same principle of like, I have some name, um, some, some account, some URL, something that I control, um, that we can point at, uh, and here's a proof that I control it and I'm going to delegate uh sort of access um or identity from that name to this did is is really the pattern and so it's it's arguable that these are just like super lightweight verified verifiable credentials um uh because that's kind of what they are um but but massively simplified um and and completely integrated with sort of the you can um model um so yeah I'll pause there before going to the the sort of like the stuff that that um, I'm kind of super excited about because I'd like I'd love to get thoughts on that as well. Um, but if anyone has any interjections at the moment, I was uh, a little curious. You mentioned email and DKIM. Is this going to be like strictly dependent on email, or is there room for uh, depending on identities? that are still public, but aren't email specifically like in the future. Yeah, for sure. So that's, that's totally possible. Um, I think Iraqli very wisely wrote up the, the, the DKIM one, um, the, the mail to one as a, as a first, like, let's look at what this looks like, but, um, you know, for example, every Mastodon instance has a key base endpoint where you can verify your Mastodon account, or, you know, you can use DNS sec, um, which is what ENS does to verify DNS domains and put it into the, the ENS um, namespace, um, or you could tweet your did um, uh, in probably in a specific format so that people don't accidentally uh, tweet your did, um, giving you access to their accounts. Um, uh, 
yeah so basically anything where you 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 have some way to publicly prove that you have control over this and can and can associate it with your with your did um you can you can use in this system in this way cool thanks also the um taking advantage of the dkim key signing stuff on email is really slick i like it a lot it's a cool idea there's a, there's a chance it might not work. We haven't actually like robustly checked to see that the signatures are correct and everything. Um, but I it, it, sorry, go I ahead. did check. I, oh. I, I did verify. Well, at least I did with a Gmail, and it kind of seemed to be the right thing. I mean, so that's eighty percent, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I also want to address what Blaine already addressed. Like, even when I was writing this, like trying to put in a spec. I realized that, yeah, this is kind of way more generic than email address and the same pattern or like just DCAM, it could be extended to other things. But again, like keeping a scope small helps. So that's kind of why I just wanted to focus on that specific. Uh, I just put this up here because I think the the illustrations are amazing there. Spectacular. This had to be on video. So uh, this is a, the doc that uh, Rackley just posted in the in the chat. So anyway, that, that's all for me. Please continue. Yeah, the deck is so good. By the way, I wanted to reiterate that. <laughs> um, so the thing that I've been really excited about, um, and this is this is an entire like side quest. You know, this is a DLC side quest. Um, uh, that, that has appeared um, and I kind of didn't want to go down this road, but here it is. Um, uh, basically with, with this, um, if we stick these into um, a DHT uh, that verify, like so the participants in the DHT basically verify that the signature is correct um, uh, um, if they know the um, if they know this, the verification scheme, so if they know how to verify a did email, for example, um, then they can hold that, these values, these, uh, these who cans, um, corresponding to the name. So the key in the DHT is the name that they're verifying. Um, so, uh, Brooke would basically say, Hey, my email address is this, that's the key insert this who can, um, into the DHT. Um, and now anybody can look up and get Brooks did uh, from this DHT. Um, and so we're jump, jumping to the end. This bit of it, I'm provisionally calling the name name system, um, <laughs> which is sort of like a generalized DNS for any name scheme um, so that we can do this sort of discovery. And this is kind of building on some of the stuff so keybase tried to do this but the this that this aspect of it with keybase was centralized um uh and and you just had to trust keybase and you had to use their apis and then they sold to zoom so uh, um uh and there have been a few similar attempts so the gnu name service uh looks quite like this but just for domain names it doesn't it's not sort of a general system um if you know of others, I would love to know about them um, because ideally we don't need to build this. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I guess the other sort of thing to point to would be Webfinger, um, which is the thing that lets you do discovery on uh, Activity Pub, like on on Mastodon names. Um, and so this is sort of like, what if Webfinger but permissionless and verifiable? Um, so that you can you can basically bootstrap your Gmail address into the Fediverse without permission from Google and without cooperation from Google, um, which I think has all sorts of um, really important implications. So we're, there's there's some questions about like how to actually structure the DHT in a way that makes this usable and useful. Um, but uh, right now those are some rough sketches, but I think, even since I talked to Brooke last, I think we have some pretty good options. So I'll I'll, I'll stop there and open the floor. Yeah, Quinn. Yeah. Quinn. Uh, so you had asked whether anyone knows of anything that already does this, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. But 
essentially what you're trying to do is global decentralized service discovery, which I'm not aware of a solution that gives that works within the constraints we care about. But service discovery is something that is widely deployed in systems like etcd and console. And I wonder whether there might be a path toward an early prototype that basically just, I don't know, like exposes etcd or console's APIs through the interface that you're defining for an NS? That's a really good thought. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely worth exploring. I guess I, I, I'm confused because I'm like, I'm not controlling, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, you're in control of this part of the conversation. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention, so um, uh, Blaine just uh, uh, mentioned that uh, we, we had a chat about this last week. Um, something that I would like to see come out of this is not not a project requirement, right? But like, that would be nice to come out of this is, uh, or I guess the hard requirement is that obviously it has to be Byzantine file tolerant to some degree. Somebody can just flood the network with too many records and overwhelm everybody and DOS the thing. That's no good, right? So like we have this difficult constraint on one side. On the other side, um, one of the things like, Everybody today, today can control their own namespace in DNS. Why don't they do that? Because then they have to <laughs> manage their own DNS, right? So uh, I'm always looking for ways of like, okay, not everything has a computer science solution. Sometimes it's a social, social solution, but we do have kind of cooler tech than we had 10 years ago. I wonder if we can create a system that doesn't require self-hosting, where people are forced to be collaborative systemically so to say and it's just like an, an early you know sort of shower thought version of it if you're trying to build a merkle tree uh and you don't need to hold the entire thing you just keep you know the path and the part of it that you care about that means you have to start including different parts of other people's data to prove your data and so you now have to collaboratively host each other basically now if you're doing that on trillions of records maybe it's a, a bigger problem um, how do you sign the updates? You know, uh, if there's concurrent rights to this thing, now you have actually lots of stuff hanging off the, the bottom as multi-values, all of this stuff, right? But it feels like there's something interesting in there. So, anyway, uh, Rackley. Yeah, I, I just wanted to note a few things uh, because Blaine mentioning them got me, uh, reminded me wanting to mention. So one thing that I plan on doing, and I would, uh, if people want to help, that would be great is uh, write a IPIP proposal, which is IPFS proposal thing for IPNS with Yukons. And there have been signals that people are interested in actually having it uh, and implementing it as being one of the ones who wanna implement it. And I think if you have another one, then it's majority. Um, and that also means if we plug in the this email piece into it, then suddenly you can have a IPNS keys that are human readable uh, and memorable too. Um, so kind of the trajectory where we want to get. And from the use case perspective, I kind of forgot one important detail. I think uh, that this also enables that I lost through while I was speaking. So maybe I'll stop. And if I remember, I'll mention later. Sorry. Awesome. Uh, I also want to celebrate the fact that I think Arakli is the first non-fission presenter at a reactor call, which is amazing. So thanks, Arakli. Uh, more questions on this topic, or should we move to the oh, next? Actually, uh, Mark, Mark Antoine's comment about using uh, employer email um, as, as a potential identity. Um, reminded me of something and I'm not even sure that it's something that the name 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 system solves um but <laughs> uh it seems like something worth considering at the very least that like very frequently and it's yeah it's probably down in like dids and ucans and stuff um but like people have multiple identities and it seems useful to be able to like link them but keep them separate or not link them and just keep them entirely separate uh and so like you can say, hey, here's my work identity. I don't want to implicitly give work access to all of my everything by saying this is like really, really me. 
uh, but I still want to be able to say that like this is still me kind of. Um, and that seems like, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a concrete question so much as a like, it seems like something to think about a bunch. <laughs> This is this is me so far, and <laughs> but please rely on another me as source of truth, if it comes to that. Uh, and just quickly, where why we're on this, I really like what Brooklyn said about the web of trust. Is it that what GPG tried to do and <laughs> only went so far? But it's also true that you said what happens with updates. The whole point of keys is that you can kind of sign the next version and you can sign the, um, and it's not absolute, but it does give you something tentative to go by, uh, unless contested. If I may go now, I, I remember what was a other important use case. So right now, and I think maybe Fusion is also doing the similar thing which somewhat makes us uncomfortable in that house. Right now, when the user creates an account, in order to be able to recover from key loss, uh, they essentially delegate all of their capabilities to our service so that we can then delegate them back when they need to rotate a key or like lost the key or whatever. Uh, and that is uncomfortable because we're we're hoping that those the, like account DIDs will be reused across a bunch of different things, uh, and that means that suddenly our service has capabilities to do things that users should have with Fusion Stack and not us. So like that's not good. So I think with this email thing, we have a really interesting solution, which under the like on surface looks the very same. People write an email or like give us an email address, and suddenly. They don't delegate to us, they actually delegate to their email address so they can later on recover when they need to rotate a key. And they get to choose whether that is acceptable security model for them, what is an acceptable trusted email address they can use, or maybe not use email address because that's not a good for fit for their like thread model. Yeah, this is something that's come up a few times uh, about this idea of, well, what if you have a sysadmin at a big company and email is attackable. It's like, cool, then they should use their public key, right? Like, so it, it should be flexible to, to, to do both. Um, what I really love about um, uh, Arachly's solution for, for this stuff is it focuses entirely on the mutable pointer aspect of this and takes it away from any other concerns. So we get this like really nice decoupling and it's human readable and the, like all the human factors sort of line up and you can bootstrap it in from the rest of the world where people actually use stuff today. So it's not that there's, you know, web three and web two, it's like, well, we need the two to like actually talk, right? Which is, yeah, it's, it's fabulous. Yeah, it also, I mean, I, I'm i working on a write-up, uh, which I hope to have done soon, um, at least a first draft that I can share some of the, the technical details and it's probably not worth going into in, on this call. Um, but, but I think like, everything that everyone's saying just totally makes sense and 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 like is is very much in line with uh with the thinking here and and i think one of the things that's really exciting to me about this is that unlike any system that i've i've seen before it really fits with so many um uh you know real world ways that we interact with identity and uh name systems and stuff so for example um uh, notaries um, are a really important thing, and building a notary system in this with this sort of scheme is basically trivial. You just have, you know, someone with a key who signs the thing that you've got, and then you post that instead of the thing that you would have posted in the first place. Um, so it's it's sort of like we can construct all sorts of things that have, you know, if not hundreds of years of precedence like thousands of years of precedent in the real world and then just apply them to the, to this system um so it's in some ways it's not inventing anything new it's just giving us a way to to kind of um uh deal with these these things so amazing any other final thoughts on this topic excellent moving on so i'm actually going to uh, versus what i had said earlier I'm going to swap uh, uh, Quinn and Zishan here. So uh, Quinn, do you want to give some uh, uh, dialogue, Pomo updates? 
Yeah, for sure. So there's really two things to talk about dialogue because most of my time has been spent writing specs, which unfortunately don't make for great demos. But uh, I did speak at Aaron Schwartz Day on Sunday this week, and that was uh, my talk, Postmodern Systems, which some of you may have seen whispers of uh, when I presented it at HPTS a couple weeks ago. But I have a link to that in chat here. Um, you might have to go back a minute or so. I was trying to find the start, but my internet's not super great here. But um, this is a talk that's kind of about the philosophy that I'm applying to kind of where I see dialogue being applied in the real world um, and how it can help us build local first applications and software that caters to diverse needs across diverse communities and people, which I think is something that we're all really targeting in this uh, D-Web and decentralized space. So if you're curious, uh, you take a look at that. Happy to have any feedback about what you see there, but um, I had a lot of fun with that one. And then um, really the second main thing for the spec work is that a lot of my time in the past, like this week and last week, has been focused on uh, getting the compilation and runtime for the query engine of Dialog specified really clearly and in a way that makes it easy for implementers to, uh, to kind of get things running. Um, there's a really great article from a couple of years ago called Against SQL, which lays out a lot of the goals for what future query engines should try to target in their design and in their specification and so on. I've got a link for that in chat too. But one of the points that uh, is made in this article is that SQL is kind of a behemoth because of how large the specification is. And getting to a working MVP for SQL takes an astronomical amount of code and like tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of lines because it's just not a very like porous or like orthogonally designed language. Uh, and this obviously causes endless problems for interop and uh, the evolution of the language because it's not very easy to build prototypes or new implementations and experiment with new features and so on. Uh, so that's something that I really want to avoid with dialog. I know we've spent the last couple of sessions talking a lot about differential data flow and differential data log and all this automatic incremental view maintenance. And I think all that's going to be super important for a lot of the applications that we're targeting. But I don't want that to be a requirement for people writing their first implementation of dialog or doing like a pedagogical implementation to better understand the system. So I've been trying to very clearly delineate the the different steps in the compilation pipeline and do a few different core languages that each provide a couple of the different features and capabilities that we care about in the query language. Uh, so these are all pending names, but right now there's kind of three layers that I've been specifying. There's what I've been calling dialog logic, dialog RA, and dialog flow. Uh, dialog RA is essentially the core language that ties everything together. RA there is relational algebra, which is the theory underpinning a lot of relational databases and more or less every relational query language. And uh, it's a very simple language that captures joins, selections, projections, et cetera. Um, but it does not support recurse server fixed point queries. So. Um, there I am specifying a variant of what's called while plus relational algebra, which basically, basically it extends the relational algebra to have inflationary semantics and looping constructs that allow it to represent the same sorts of queries that you are able to represent in something like data log, but while still being able to guarantee con termination and uh, a fixed point. So uh, that, that while plus RA is basically the core language that uh, that implementations must support in order to in order to get the dialogue semantics that we want from the system. And in the simplest implementation, uh, that could just be a fairly naive implementation of the relational algebra, basically just like a tree walking interpreter over RA query plans. But then it's very easy to get more performant implementations out of that by taking like a semi-naive evaluation strategy like you often see in uh, data log, 
or by dropping down to a lot of the data flow stuff that I've been talking about lately. Uh, and that's being described in a spec for what's tentatively dialogue flow, which is just essentially a uh, data flow runtime over the while plus relational algebra that uh, does all of that fancy calculus magic to let you automatically incrementalize programs. Uh, and uh, then on top of that, we have dialogue logic, which is basically a higher level, more expressive IR or core language, whatever you want to call it. I haven't quite locked down the terms yet that uh, that basically gives you these deductive capabilities that we love from Datalog, but in a way that maps really nicely onto that Dialog RA IR, and that makes compilation from any of these steps to any of the lower ones uh, fairly trivial. Um, so that's going really well. I'm finding that separating things out like that is really clearing up the spec and making it obvious to me uh, which pieces of the system belong at which layer, which parts are optional, which ones uh, are things that we spent a lot of time on because of use cases that maybe we at Fission specifically have, but that broader users of the system may not care as much about. Um, that's a good question, Daniel. So right now, a lot of that work is happening inside the Fission spec repo, which I can grab a link to in a second. Um, there's a very work in progress directory in there uh, called Dialog, which is where I've been uh, pushing a lot of this to. It's not super up to date right now. I have a, a fairly big reorganization branch that I've been working on locally that I really need to push up today or tomorrow. Uh, but that's kind of where my scratch pad has been for a lot of the specification work. Um, yeah, honestly, uh, in terms of the query engine, a lot of the answers are are clearing up as I'm writing the spec. It's forcing me to to answer all of those nitty gritty questions that uh, that you don't need to think about when you are talking about the system at a higher level. So it's been a super valuable process, and it's going well. Kirk, do you have a question? Yeah, a leading question for you. So in, in the, the docs, it doesn't really say dialogue in a lot of mm -hmm. places. Why is that? Yeah, so we've been using dialogue as a code name for a couple of months now. And I love it as a code name because really what we're building is a local first database that works by, by interposing like a dialogue between systems that kind of communicate back and forth to figure out what they mean about different pieces of data. And it's a really fun name, but it's ungoogleable, and it's also confusing when every piece of the system is called dialogue. <laughs> and uh, as I've been specifying things, I'm like realizing that I'm writing sentences like the dialogue query language over the dialogue database uh, compiles down to the dialogue data flow. And it's just kind of a mess and I'm confusing myself. So tentatively, uh, I've started using POMO as a prefix, uh, as like a development code name. Um, that's not something that I'm committing to, but uh, in the code, in the spec repo, what you're actually seeing is like POMO raw, POMO flow and POMO logic. It's a lot shorter. Uh, it is a lot more Googleable. And it has a lot of really fun connotations with some of this postmodern philosophy work that I've been talking about a little bit and that I spoke at, at uh, spoke about at Aaron Schwartz Day earlier this week. Plus, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, we always like to commission mascots for our projects. So if we do end up naming this PomoDB, then there's a really great opportunity, I think, to have a super cute Pomeranian mascot. So I think it's kind of a win across the board. But I'm not a branding expert. Expert. That's Ryan, who I believe also says he's not a branding expert. So I'm not committing to the name Pomo, but I'm a fan. I am curious about uh, what other people feel about it, though. It's kind of a silly name, but uh, I think we're kind of a silly company. So, and and the the other thing to note on why it's modern is even the the way we think about data. The, that there's no single source of truth 
right? All of these things do play back into that postmodern idea. So postmodernism, really, if you want to get geeky about it, is built into the DNA of this thing. So it's not even in, incorrect to call it a postmodern database. Anyway. Yeah, I am a huge fan of the name Floofs. I wish that were still around, but I understand why it isn't. Does anybody want to tell the story of Floofs? Okay, cool. It's going to be me. Uh, the web native file system, uh, which started out as the fission file system or FFS, which we decided, well, maybe FFS is not going to be super Google Googleable and might have the wrong connotation. Um, then became, you know, we looked what ends in FS and I just like on a dictionary search and one of them was floofs uh, and being kind of a wacky team. We thought, oh, floofs, sure. The, oh, what was it again? Visions local first online offline file system, something like that, um, which we thought was hilarious for about 10 days. And then people started going like, I don't know about this name anymore. So we switched it to the web native file system, which is still also a placeholder that could that could also change. And um, did that change happened how long ago when we still find references to floofs everywhere? <laughs> so I don't know how long dialogue is going to be showing up in the tracks. For, for a while, I think. Um, any questions about uh, about the dialogue slash POMO uh, stuff before we wrap up here? Uh, we're, we're getting very close to time. Oh, well, we are at time. I do always we, we have demos I can show, but we're at time, so maybe I could save them for another time. <laughs> They're mostly just fun demos. It's nothing people haven't seen before, just tied together in new ways. Uh, we can also do an after party uh, as well, but uh, for for the video, uh, and any uh, questions about, I, like I, I guess on one hand, we've been pulling stuff into specs is the, the main chunk of work. People would like to read the specs. Um, but any questions, thoughts, comments? All right, excellent, cool. Well, uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'm gonna uh, stop the video now and that'll get posted online. Um, looking forward to see you all for next month as well, which will be the last one of the year, which seems to be coming up too, too fast. So um, stopping the recording now.